Welcome to another edition of the Corner Booth Podcast here from the Stoughton Delicatessen. I'm Aaron Rand along with Leslie Chesterman, Bill Brownstein, and today we're talking food, which makes sense because there's already food on the table. And this is Leslie's wheelhouse, so let's start wheelhouse. off. Wheelhouse, I like that. Yeah, this is, this is what you do. Yep. Um, and this week, big week, we had two big lists come out. Canada's top 100 restaurants. Yes. Followed by uh, McLean's top 20 in Canada. Yes. Uh, you've eaten at all 100 of them, I think, <laughs> at one point or another. <laughs> I feel career. like yeah, I've eaten at all of them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So let's first of all talk about the list, what qualifies this list, because I'm sure people watching today are going to think, okay, great tip, I'm going to try eating here. You can't have eaten at all of them, so... Right. That first list of the top 100 Canada's best, your take on that. Okay, well, this list is interesting because it came out, I believe, in 2015, the first one. It's kind of the brainchild of Jacob Richler, son of Mordecai, who uh, in the past uh, wrote a lot about food, and he also was a restaurant critic of the National Post for a while. And um, so he really flipped off the idea of, I don't know if flipped off is the right expression, but you Probably know, not. was inspired yeah. by the idea, sorry, <laughs> wrong expression, uh, from the world's 50 best, which is a massive list, which came out 20 years ago. Um, and so he's inspired by that. Now, the thing is about this list is that there are 130 odd judges. It's increased a lot. When you of say years. odd. Well, because it's 130-ish. <laughs> that's right. I didn't 135. Mean, I didn't mean odd. I'm saying everything wrong. It's 135. It's 100, okay. So he, um, so he has a ton of judges. Apparently, he's not a judge himself. Okay. So uh, I think he coordinates the whole thing. And Wait, is that part of the problem then? The fact that there's 130 different people? I'm guessing they're not all chefs either. Absolutely. So in the first list, I remember Getty Lee was one of the was oh, one of the okay. judges, and everybody's saying, you know, but Getty Lee probably goes out to a lot more restaurants, You're right. a lot of restaurants yeah. yep. do. Uh, you know, diversity in the judges game is fine. Um, if it's all chefs, that's not good either, because actually chefs don't go out to eat all that much either. Monday um, nights. The problem is you're getting a whole kind of mishmash of opinions that are being put together. And I think a big problem with these lists is there are too many people who are, you know, I wrote a substack on this and I called the circle jerk of constantly chef friends recommending the same places instead of people really going out and looking for hidden gems or going to some of the older restaurants that are no longer in, you know. So on this list, for instance, when we talk about who made it and who didn't, uh, you know, an iconic Montreal restaurant like Le Club Chasse Pêche isn't on there. And I just think, well, this year, or the, the sister chef Le Filet. Or, or Le Filet, the, the kind of chef group or judges group, or it's um, it just decided that it just didn't come up in conversation. But that said, Leslie, um, two things. First of all, Mont Lapin, uh, which is in Little Italy, I, which topped both lists, I, I think is fair. I mean, it is very interesting, very audacious kind of dining. I mean, whether it's number one, I don't know, but uh, it's interesting because these guys, as you well know, uh, Vanya and Marco both came out of the Joe Beef uh, mini empire on Notre Dame, and uh, they, they worked their way there. What really gratified me, though, was the number eight pick, Abiba, which to my mind is one of the most interesting, fascinating little places in Verdun. You haven't been there yet in no, Verdun. A, a lot of these restaurants have come from the Joe Beef Empire, which and, is very and interesting. And Shore, the... Uh, he was at Liverpool he, House. He was the chef at yes. Liverpool House. That, but, that's a restaurant, by the way, at Biba, the size of this table, I think, right? It's it, the smallest place I've ever It 28, but you know what? The guy, South American, Argentinian, him and his brother, they opened at the worst possible time. COVID almost shut them down. He sunk his entire life savings into this place and uh, he hung in and uh, I got to tell you it's one of the most interesting places we will go there Leslie we will go there I, th I think it's with all of these lists it's important to point out that everybody who's on the list really deserves to be on the list and right. I agree with Bill that the number one spot really you have to understand that these two people who are running this restaurant although they're I believe they're four partners Mont Lapin is run by seasoned professionals. I mean, right. These aren't people who just started yesterday. These are people with long careers in uh, well, Marconi, over, Papier, over 20 years, Joe yeah. Beef, right. uh, Vin Papillon. So these are really sharp shooters. You know, and, and they represent Montreal very well. And Montreal was very well represented on both of these lists. So dominated. We, dominated, finally, because Toronto yeah. for some years, there were some years that Vancouver dominated some of these lists. So Montreal, I think, is where it deserves to be at the top. However, okay. there will always be a problem with lists is that there will always be people who are left out. But that is normal. I think what bothers me more 
especially in the 100 best list, is the way they are ranked. So, you know, I've, you know, the top 10 is very, very strong, you know, no complaints really. I just think when you start going down the list, when you see restaurants that are kind of at number 76, um, and then you see a restaurant like L'Express, which is amazing, and I'm the biggest fan of L'Express, but it's not a gastronomic restaurant on the same level as a restaurant like Arvi in Quebec, which is a much, you know, I think anybody would agree that sometimes you see the ones at the bottom, and the ranking matters. You know, the ranking matters to a lot of people. It's not top 10 and everything else. No, you, it starts point. to be who is ranked where. And so Look at Park, for example. 99. 99. You know? yeah. And I mean, in Antonio's mind, I'm guessing he would have rather not been on that list altogether. For many years, he wasn't. Yes. Right. And, and you know, you look at like places like Le Serpent, which right. is kind of part of that group of Chasse Pêche and Le Filet. I mean, that was way up there as well. And you're right. And it's, if you include L'Express, why don't you include Le Mayac, for example? I was at Le Mayac yesterday. Perfect Perfect right. lunch experience. And not on the list. Not on the not list. On the list. Not on and the list. Also, when you compare the two lists, you know, you will see a restaurant like Damas, which yes. really is one of Montreal's best restaurants, Syrian restaurant, fantastic restaurant. Best Middle restaurant, East place. Best Middle Eastern restaurant. City. Made one list, doesn't make the, the other, other right. list. So uh, there is a big difference between these lists, which is one of them, which Aaron mentioned just now, one of them does have 130-odd judges. 35. And the other one... Um, has one judge, Chris Nuttlesmith, who was the restaurant critic of the uh, Globe and Mail for a long time. I think he's also on Top Chef Canada. He went to 50 restaurants across Canada. First of all, way to go, Chris Nuttlesmith, because the idea, of, for yeah. me, of eating in 50 restaurants just almost makes me ill. That is so much to do, and he's very slim. But um, So it's one opinion compared to 100. 35 opinions. I found his choices very interesting. And the choices were interesting. He obviously likes Montreal a lot. He's from Toronto. You know, also there are, you know, I wonder how they feel in Manitoba. Or I was going to say, there's got to be New some Brunswick regional disparity, or, right? Yes, if you yes. live out in the, in the prairies or you live in the Maritimes, you know, you're going to want to vote for actually, a restaurant. Uh, Newfoundland gets did, recognized did a get lot. Recognized, yeah. uh, BC gets recognized a lot. Yeah. Not so much Edmonton, Calgary, I don't the think. The prairies. Calgary, there was a restaurant. There, yeah. there were restaurants. But there's a restaurant in Calgary? There There's is one, one on the okay. 20. Anything in I, Saskatchewan? I, I, no, I no restaurants in Saskatchewan, which is actually the bread basket of North America. True. So great farms and farmers. But um, so let, let there's me bring pressure this. also, I'm sure, for these critics, both lists, to have people from coast to coast and not... Uh, you know, miss out on anything good. But, you know, of course, the big cities like Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal will always dominate. And that's another problem because even in Quebec, a lot of places in the regions, right. like the Re- Laurentians that are really up-and-coming restaurants, are not represented at all. But that said, I mean, first of all, it, Quebec really dominated. Out of 100 on, the Quebec had 34 restaurants. Right. That's over right. one-third. Right. And Montreal at 27, but yet... There were another uh, seven outside the city that also uh, featured on the list. So, yes. uh, you know, which is also very telling. But y- you're right for the most part. They don't go venture far afield. So l- let me bring this back to something that you and I talked about the other day, which was the idea that, great, you can now look at a list. People will say, great, we can find a new place to eat. How many of these are actually what you would call affordable dining? Very few. because. Very few. Uh, there's one thing in the um, in the McLean's. I was going to say the Globe and Mail. The McLean's feature that Chris Nuttlesmith wrote, which is about affordability of restaurants. It's a kind of a side essay. It's really worth reading of yep. what has changed since the pandemic. And one of the things he points out is that it's gotten so much more expensive to dine out. But the exception being Montreal, where he says you really can find much more affordable restaurants. So good for us, because when you go out and dine out in Toronto, it is unbelievably expensive uh richer city toronto as well but higher rents higher staff he was saying that he was talking to a chef who had to pay 30 dollars an hour for his dishwasher so we're seeing a big change since the pandemic a lot of people better than journalism look don't think i'm not thinking of it just get some rubber gloves you know um all the steam is good for your pores you know but um yeah so i think that uh we're going to be paying more, but in Montreal, he said there's still a lot of chefs who believe in feeding the locals around the restaurant. And he mentioned Mastard, which is an amazing right. restaurant. Simon Matisse, who was named uh, Chef of the Year at last year's Laurier de la Gastronomie, 
it, it, Mastard made both lists. Yes. Mon Lapin made both lists. Number Mastard three Mastard on the yeah. McLean's list. A wonderful, yeah. really a good restaurant Neighbor- with a very talented Well, Mon Lapin is also a, like a neighborhood restaurant. Yes, I yes, mean, yes. It, it could have easily headed off to Old Montreal, downtown, Notre Dame, and they went to like saint Zodique, you know, and yeah. not exactly, you know, no, nobody would have anticipated that kind of success there. But people find out about it. Elena, which is in St. Henri, which made the list in terms of uh, McLean's, uh, again, a neighborhood little pizza place, and all of a sudden, like that... Yeah, which bird- brings me... So how does a neighborhood pizza place like Elena make a list of top dining experiences? Well, and, and that was on the McLean's list. Yeah, because also, it was, yeah, it was on the McLean's list. and not Did, a, Didn't make the other ones. And right. interestingly enough, Gia and, and, Nora, Gray and Nora Gray, did w- owned by the same group, did the 100 Best, but not this one. Yeah, I think the 100 Best has so much to do with compiling all of the results whereas the single critic you'll really get the ones that he liked the most so that's why you're getting a very different um, perspective on these two lists you're getting a very it's quite a different list I mean there are some things in common but it's quite different Um, I think it's super interesting that there's a gem of a restaurant in Quebec City called Batuto uh, which I'm telling you it's so amazing that you cannot get a reservation at this restaurant and last year it was named Restaurant of the Year by the Laurier de la Gastronomie. And last time I was in Quebec City, I wanted to go and eat there. And they open the reservations on the first of every month at like 9 a.m. And you get on the website and it's already sold out. So wow. I, I also think there's accessibility. So a great restaurant like Batuto, maybe nobody got, maybe it's not on the list because it's so impossible. But to I'm eat guessing there. a guy like uh, Mr. Nuttall Smith there would have easily got you know, it. I, I mean, if you make a few calls, maybe, but wow, I mean, I hope he went. It's a perfect Italian restaurant. Can we bring this to back to Montreal for a second? So yes. we're talking in general, uh, the restaurants that made the list here. What on the list surprised you either from having made it or not having made it? Well, depending on the list. Ah, well, not having made it, let's t- start with the restaurant called Foxy, Diane Solomon's restaurant on Notre Dame. From Olive and what it, Mando, Not right? only is it excellent with a great woman chef, it really surprised me because there's sommelier... Uh, Veronique Dahl, who's an amazing sommelier, was named Best in Canada. So there's sommeliers Best in Canada. The restaurant, the restaurant. doesn't make the list. Um, of course, Le Club Chasse Pêche bothered me. The two restaurants in the um, uh, in the Laurentians, one called La Belle Histoire, one called L'Epicurieux, fantastic restaurants, didn't make the list. Uh, closer to home, Au Pied de Cochon didn't make the list. Yes, the Cabana yes, Soup, yes. Au Pied de Cochon didn't make the right. list. Uh, Jacob Richler years ago said he thought the food at the Cabana was disgusting. Uh, he said that in the Globe and Mail. I don't know if that still, uh, you know, filters down to today, but their third restaurant, the Cabana d'à Côté, did make the list. But still, Au Pied de Cochon is a very important restaurant around here, and it's still a very good restaurant. Le Mac did not make the list. So, sure, there are a lot that didn't make the list. Nothing surprises me that's on the list. But you know what's interesting, actually, is that all the the, the favorites in years gone by, like Joe Beef, the Liverpool... Are down. Are down. Toke. Uh, Toke. Toke. Toke, not yeah. even... I think it's 34 or something. Or no, even yeah, further, further up. I think it's 50. Like, but the point being, though, that like almost so high up, and yet none of them, they, they were in the 100 best, but Liverpool wasn't. But none of those restaurants, that, that group from Notre Dame West there, made it to the McLean's list, which I find kind of interesting. Right. Well, the McLean's list is just so much smaller. Yeah, yeah. but I'm saying like most people, like when they come to Montreal, especially out of towners, they're always like flocking to you well, know sure, the, because it's earned a reputation right. right whether it's still that way or not and seems to okay not as well and none of them appeared on the yeah. planes list and Toke, mm. which was for the first two years the one the top number one. of the and also it's also interesting just to show what kind of a circle jerk this is that um, Jacob Richler did the first McLean's list uh, in 2012, which was very controversial because Au Pied Cochon and Joe Beef didn't make that list. You know, it's like these lists. But one thing that's interesting about these lists is I'm starting to think that lists have, you know, are big money. You know, there's a lot of advertising. Like and Michelin lists, Guide, yeah. Well, and lists are also taking over. <clears throat> when you look at who's doing these lists, so you have Jacob Richler, Chris Nettlesmith, two restaurant critics who used to be at the two biggest papers in Canada that dropped their restaurant critics. So now that we're losing restaurant critics, and Gazette doesn't have a restaurant critic anymore, a lot of these restaurant critics are doing things like these lists, which are obviously very profitable. I mean, I, I don't envy them because I think... Like I said, eating in so many restaurants is re- 
going coast to coast for I don't know how long eating in all these restaurants must be it sounds like a great job but I'm sure it would be very but is there a parallel you know and you've talked about this before in terms like people don't realize people ask why doesn't Montreal have any Michelin started restaurants and and the reason is they're not invited here because they they would have to pay them I do believe yes well okay now there was I think it was also Chris Mm Nettle Smith in his uh, McLean's feature who said uh, tourist boards subsidize Michelin lists and I love that because it's it's good to admit it like we have to really come out and say over and over again especially to Montrealers who say why aren't we in a Michelin guide and you're like because our tourism board didn't cough up a million bucks um, but, Which people are unaware of. But also, you know, look at the parallels because a lot of restaurants uh, that are on those lists aren't on the McLean's list, you know, right. the 20 list. So, you know, that is a different standard of judging. So all of these people have different standards of judging. What actually is the most interesting are the restaurants that made both lists. Are there but, but biases, But let me though? ask this. I want to understand with respect to... The popularity of types of food. Right. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, maybe we could have talked about steakhouses always being towards the top of the list. I'm wondering how much of the change from what you've seen in these lists right. reflects the fact that people want to enjoy or have other different types of food. Farm to table seems to be the big thing now, right? Those restaurants tend to do well. Old school, old style steakhouses, if you want to call them that, not even there. I think there's a huge um, pressure on all critics now is since this great uh, restaurant critic from the LA Times called Jonathan Gold discovered all the food trucks, all the street food that we can't just say food is good if it's in an ama- if it's in a beautiful what we call a white tablecloth setting. Now it can come from a food truck. Right. Delicious food is delicious food. So actually, you see some of the really high end places suffering, and they're putting huge investment on let's say their their their, their everything from their napkins to their tablecloths to their paying their sommelier compared to some person on the McLean's list. There's a noodle shop, and the picture is. You know, all of the dishes are served in styrofoam containers. So it's a different standard. But I think now everybody's saying if the food's good, the food's good. Um, you know, I, I got to say, I still have weak, a weakness for a restaurant that really works well. So when we're talking about a restaurant like Limayac, I was there, you know, yesterday on a Thursday at lunch. Okay, it's probably a busy day in Montreal. Pack to the rafters, line up at the door, seamless uh, experience, perfect food, um, and a beautiful sp- spot. And not on the list. So, you know, what do you look for in a restaurant? Do you want it to be really edgy? Do you want it to be, um, uh, you know, cool, as we say, ethnic eats, and you can't say ethnic eats anymore, which is great. So let's say, uh, uh, you know, whatever, less expensive, but still delicious. Or So critics, you know, as much as we're looking for restaurants from Manitoba, we're also looking for restaurants at all price ranges. But what happens then is that, you know, you also, should we be adding extra marks to people who are investing in making it a fine dining experience? That's a good point. The Corner Booth Podcast is brought to you in part by the Snowden Delicatessen, where we are. 75 years in business, the home of Montreal's greatest smoked meat, plus Carnotzel, potato latkes, and the famous Snowden Deli party sandwiches. That's the Snowden Delicatessen. You're, I, I don't want to put you on the spot and say what's your list. So we talked about some of the ones you like and some of the ones that are not on this list. But for people watching, uh, looking for a different kind of dining experience from where you've been to, right. say, in the last year or so, right. what do you like? What do you recommend? And then yeah. we'll leave out the whole affordability part because we right. talked about that earlier. What would you sort of suggest? You know, it's a tough question because um, ever since the pandemic, I don't go out as much. It, you know, when you're doing this as a job, you go out all the time. Sure. And now I kind of go out to where I want to go out. So, um, you know, if I'm going to have a smoked meat, no kidding, I will come here because this is delicious smoked meat. If I no want to, deli on this list, Dad. Yeah, no oh, deli on this list. How is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Unbelievable. Really. And, uh, or if I want to go for a great bistro experience, I'll go to Le Mac, like or L'Express. I went to both this week. If, so you start going to the restaurants you like. <clears throat> but let's say I want to go to a restaurant that I'd recommend that to me idealizes what's a great Montreal restaurant right now. I love a restaurant called Antoinetta, run by three guys who, in a very casual setting, make great Italian food. It's very noisy, but it's very relaxed. Uh, there's a restaurant called Paloma, which is on the list, um, which is very good. I prefer it at dinner time than at lunch. Um, very small, chef-owned restaurant. That's what you want, these small, chef-owned restaurants. But, you know, I, I still, you know, I still have a soft spot. If somebody invited me to Toke tomorrow, I'd be thrilled and I'd be very happy to go because these are super competent chefs making beautiful food with local ingredients. Something like Norman Laprise is still, you know, the person who invented Quebec cuisine and he's still, I think, at the top of his game. It's just that 
there are people now who've maybe surpassed him because Toke was really big 10 years ago. It's not that he's not good anymore. It's just that right. restaurants are all about what's hot and what's trendy and what's in right now, and you'll never have the same place in any city at the top anymore. You know, yeah, but you know what's interesting is a place like Mont Lapin, I know them, they never aspired to, like, the last thing they wanted to do was be, like, part of the cool gang, be on the top list, they, like, they say that. They never aspired to be number one in the country. I think they were more shocked than anybody. I mean, they, you know, they expected the Joe Beefs and the Tokays and all the rest to be there. But yet, you know, but, and yet, I, you see where judges, <clears throat> like, turn to places like that because right. exactly they don't have those kinds of aspirations. Well, critics and judges are looking for an authentic, original, right. delicious, friendly experience. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, before I even opened any of these lists, I knew Mont Lapin would be number one. You did, I, eh? well, I knew it, I knew it. And and I just felt, you know, I felt it was their time. I felt that they'd have enough buzz or enough, you know, a lot of people were talking about them. And I knew that that team could deliver a really super experience. You also have to understand, and this is debatable, but to me, having been here all my life, is that Montreal is the restaurant scene to beat. I mean, there are people who come from, all, chefs who come from all over the country to eat in Montreal. Uh, we are the trend setters and not the trend followers. I think we still have the strongest chef scene. I'm not surprised to see. I'm surprised in the years that we don't really have a great showing. But year after year, I also have to say Quebec City, amazing restaurant scene, amazing ingredients. You know, in Quebec, we have over 300 varieties of cheese, whereas elsewhere in Canada, they might have four. And this is really where everything's happening. A lot of ingredients that are being used all across the country are coming from this province. We have a much deeper dining culture. Our customers are much more uh, savvy when it comes to things like even the wine scene here is miles ahead of anywhere else in the Great. country. And this isn't just me patting myself. Or we're all happy to be Montrealers. They're looking for something to love in this We city. have nothing to brag about. We Suddenly have nothing we've else but our restaurant. As I said, right. like I, I pointed out, like I mean, it's great to have some kind of bragging rights for food because the only other thing we would is for our non-edible orange cones. But, you know, I, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's absolutely, I love that line. But there's another thing, too, which is especially for Anglophones, you know, all of these issues we have about language and all this. Montreal right. has to stay as French as possible when it comes to things like restaurants because, my God, we have something so special and unique here when it comes to tourists. It's the envy not only of Canadian chefs, but a lot of North American yeah. chefs come here because we have, we have a hot little scene here and let's you know, preserve that. I'm going to wrap up, but and maybe this is unfair. So we talked about some of the places you like. We also mentioned affordability is an issue. You mentioned, I think, L'Express the other day. What used to cost $100 right. for two people is now probably closer to $200. Two, absolutely. Not affordable right. to that many people. What about budget-friendly places you could recommend just to close? Oh, Aaron, you got me here. I, you here know, for. if I want to eat budget-friendly places, you I go. eat at my house, you know. <laughs> okay, one thing that is interesting on both... Chalet okay, barbecue. Not budget-friendly, <laughs> but let's just say on both lists was this restaurant called Mastard, which we talked about. And I think you will get a fine dining yeah. experience for less than you would at some other places. Okay. So if you want something really great that will cost you less, try Mastard. It's an amazing little restaurant. I know why it made both lists. It's fantastic. It's in Rosemount, yep. Um, you know... I have a hard time with the budget eats um, because I think these days it's more important to pay, go out less, pay a little more, make sure that the people who are serving you are getting well paid, that the dishwasher is getting well paid, that the waiters and chefs are getting well paid. There's a huge revolution going on in the dining scene is that people were treated badly for too long and they've had enough of it. A lot of people walked away and those that are staying behind are saying, that's fine, but you're all going to have to pay more to eat here. And I'm fine with that. But it's not that I, I don't want to overpay. Let's put it that way. I don't want to shell out $400 for two people for dinner, which is not hard to do these days. Uh, and next thing you know, you are shelling out that money. But, you know, if you're paying $150 for two people and you get a really nice tasting menu and you get really good service, you're getting a deal these days. Oh, absolutely. So there's a restaurant like Il Flatant, which is on the 100 best list. That is a wonderful, it, it, uh, that is like a date night or whatever night experience, celebration night. And you're having a really great gourmet experience that in Europe would cost you twice as much. What's the name of that restaurant? It's called Il Flatant. Ile Flottante? Yeah, Ile Flottante, which is a floating island. Ah, yeah. okay. So Where, just think where's like, that? That is over in uh, on, on the plateau. What street okay. is it on? It's on St. Vierder, I Ile think. Ile Flottante. Yeah, Ile Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right, we're out of time. Bill, thank you. Leslie, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Hope you got enough suggestions as to where you can eat, or, or you could come here to Snowden Deli. Um, but I would, I would hurry because this is not going to last long. <laughs> uh, thanks to the folks here for hosting us as well. We'll see you on the corner booth again soon.